tonight. Uh, my name's John O'Turner. I'm part of the board, and I'm here to uh, start this presentation of Daryl's. Um, we're going to start with a, a few housekeeping items. You will all be muted, but can send your questions or comments through the question, answer, or through the chat. We'll answer what we can during the session, and Daryl will answer questions at the end. If you'd like to see closed caption of the audio, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. The session is being recorded and we'll send a link to the recording along with the presentation a couple days after the workshop. If you need technical assistance, please chat with the host, Jessica, who is our Zoom host tonight. And let's see. So here's a little bit about Daryl. He's been 10 years at CASFAS, and I know he had a farm before all this. He's a PhD candidate focusing on no-till vegetable production, which is really kind of cutting edge right now and important work. And of course, you know, he loves the soil. He loves his tractor, I know that. And he's a great teacher. Um, I was an apprentice in 2018 and I just love what Daryl shared with us and how he shared it. So tonight's workshop is gonna be really cool, I think. Thanks so. for setting a low bar, Jono. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no problem, Daryl. So, um, Tonight's workshop is sponsored by uh, the Friends of the UC Santa Cruz Farm and Garden. Uh, low class public workshops are brought to you by the Center for Agroecology and the Friends of the UCSC Farm and Garden. If you're not a Friends member, we encourage you to become one tonight. Besides supporting the farm, you get discounts at local school nurseries, invitations to exclusive events, and updates about the excellent work the Center for Agroecology is doing, plus knowledge that you're contributing to a food system solutions through education and research. Um, we've got, yeah, some lists of uh, discounts. I've actually used some of those today. And uh, then there's the link to uh, joining down the bottom. And, and with that, I think it's time to start with Daryl. All right, thank you, Jono. Um, all right, folks, um, I, uh, you know, despite it being two years into this whole virtual thing, um, I am still, I'd say a relative novice at the webinar and the Zoominar things. So, um, Thank you for your patience with me as I uh, navigate it. Um, you know, I think for a lot of us instructors that do this kind of on um, on the ground teaching um, at the farm, it, it can be very disorienting to try to teach to um, a blank audience, especially in a webinar where um, a lot of times I can't even see your faces. Um, I'm just looking at my presentation screen. So um, for those of us that really um engage with feedback and try to read the crowd uh, this can be a little bit disconcerting um so i'm going to say that out loud that said um i've got the little chat box open in the corner of my screen as i'm presenting and i would love it if folks just dropped things in there questions and things i am not going to promise to answer them or see it all the time but to the degree that i can get some feedback that way um i would really appreciate it um the other thing that i generally say um, just when I'm talking out and about on the farm is that, um, you know, I could go on and on about whatever thing is interesting to me, but it's always better if I'm going on and on about something that's interesting to you. So um, to that effect, again, referencing the chat, make sure that you all, if there's a slide that I'm on that you want me to spend a little bit more time on or there's questions, um, do go ahead and pop in those questions. Um, the other thing that I will say, you know, I think this is this is always my disclaimer section before I jump into the um, to the class or the workshop. 
Um, so the other disclaimer is that um, while I love soils, I love teaching about soils, um, I typically, you know, I do some courses for our undergraduates on campus, a lot of work with the apprenticeship and our beginning farmers, but I honestly have not really done this for home gardeners. Um, so this is a little bit of a first for me. So I, um, Elise was so kind as to lend me um, her slides for this presentation, and I thought I would take it, um, uh, take it from her perspective and do my best to approach it in this way. So um, again, I'm kind of trying something new. So again, any feedback I can have um, from the chat, um, I think would be great. Um, and yeah, any direction I think that folks want to go um, in this, whether you can kind of see in the general overview what we're going to be looking at. But you know, if folks want to spend a little bit more time on the soil science aspects of it, um, or if folks really want to talk more about you know, how do you apply this in your home garden? I'm really happy to focus on those. Or, you know, potentially what are some of the new frontiers in, or things that we're thinking about um, in terms of soil and soil management from kind of organic and, and no-till systems and these questions about carbon sequestration and things like that. Um, I'm really happy to, yeah, speak to any of those more. So if folks um, just on those kind of three topical areas that folks have and you're like, yeah, moron, I want to know how to apply this in my home garden. I want to know more about the basic soil science. I want to know more about the um, kind of new frontiers. Drop those into the chat and that'll help give me a little bit of a sense of, yeah, what you're interested in. Or maybe none of those, something else. Um, but as I'm, I think, going through the, the, the webinar, um, you know, I, I can reference that and we'll kind of go that direction. Okay, so let's get going. So um, yeah, we're going to do a quick just overview on soil. Why is it so important? Um, you know, this is some of the stuff that I always take as a given um, when I start my courses. So I normally don't don't go there, but we'll do that. We'll do a little bit on the basics of soil science and then really this kind of um, application section of how do we add this organic matter? How do we build our soil through cover crops and other techniques? That's really, um, I think, what the take home um, will be for you all in terms of your, your garden management. So um, okay. This is a great slide. I mean, I think just, you know, it's, it's always a good reminder of why are we, why do we do what we do at the center? Why do we care about um, agroecology? And really, I think it centers around, you know, how important agriculture is to um, us as a species, you know, no matter what culture or what place in the world you come from, food touches you. And the way that our agricultural system has really developed um, is that it has a ton of environmental and social consequences um, that I think we've had a blind eye to for a long time um, and we're beginning to reconcile. But, um, you know, these are, these are the questions that we are trying to approach when, um, when we're thinking about how we transform the face of agriculture um, from the center's perspective. So, Again, it consumes a huge percent of our arable land. And in the process, we've degraded so much of our soil using our kind of industrial practices um, that are focused much more on production than actual kind of ecological management of the soil. Um, so this is a great statistic that, you know, we degrade six pounds of soil for every one pound of food produced. And that is clearly not um, a sustainable ratio. Um, you know, in terms of climate change, and, you know, this is, what a great time to be talking about soil and soil carbon um, when it's, you know, the second week of February, and we haven't seen rain since December. Um, this is definitely unprecedented in my time in Santa Cruz. Um, and I think just, you know, while I think again, you know, a dry February like we're having right now in the back of a dry January is unprecedented. In many ways, I'm also simultaneously not surprised um, because I think the last five to 10 years have been marked with drought and unpredictability around our weather um, to a degree that, you know, it's not that surprising to me that um, we would see these six weeks um, of, of dry. But to the degree that that is related to climate change and to the degree that agriculture is um, impacting climate change um, with greenhouse gas emissions, you know, this is a new type of agriculture, we really need to focus on it. Um, and a lot of that comes with managing the soil. Um, so, um, and again, you know, topsoil um, is not a resource to be squandered. Um, again, in the wild, you know, folks will often give this metric that it takes about 100 years to create one inch of topsoil. Um, we have, you know, with some management, we hope we can do it a little bit faster or improve our soil a little bit faster. 
Um, but this is not something to mess around with, right? And um, when I go around to new, you know, or to, to agricultural projects these days, you know, the thing that's always at the forefront of my mind is really about how do we keep land in production? How do we not, one, degrade it to a point that we can't farm it anymore? Or two, how do we not make sure we don't pave over it, develop it, um, use it for some other uses? Because you know, some of this prime agricultural land, a lot of which we have in California, um, we can't remake it um, once we lose it. Lose it. Um, okay, this is a great slide um, about how soil is made. And you know, when we think about systems that are not managed, right? Um, basically, there's all this organic material, these this leaf litter or things, so on a forest floor, um, leaf litter that piles on top of the soil, and then all these living things, um, the worms that you can see, and lots of the little um, microbes, the bacteria and the fungi that you can't see are gonna work on decomposing those things. Um, and eventually over time, that will create soil. Um, and so this is what it would look like in a natural system. Another way to approach this is really thinking about um, you know, in the understory of a forest, you're going to have that leaf litter that's, um, that's on the ground that kind of is soil, and then the plants are going to sprout up from that, and we'll have our kind of six ecological successions. Also, in kind of a prairie, when you think about the Great Plains and the bed breadbasket of the United States, you know, this was, um, the cycle was grasses that would grow up all year round, um, die back in the, in the, uh, with the snows in the winter, while there were bison that were munching on those grasses and dropping their manure and um, dropping some of that organic matter, there was just this layering process that happened year over year over year to create these kind of really deep soils um, that we have basically been mining for the last, you know, about a hundred years since we've really, so the agriculture has really taken off in a kind of industrial way um, in the U.S. Um, so, in some ways, when you talk about soil, you do, um, it's kind of a hot topic now, um, which is great, um, but I, it is important to, to think about soil carbon. And the main reason is that when we think about, um, we'll get into some of these pieces of, of what's in the soil and what's that really important piece of the soil and it's, it's soil organic matter, um, we will get to defining that. But what's really important to know is that half of that soil organic matter is soil organic carbon. Um, so when we talk about all of the magic that soil organic matter does, um, how we improve our soil, we're really talking about how do we get carbon back into our soils. Um, when we're thinking about climate change, um, a lot of things about how do we get the CO2 out of the atmosphere, where do we put it, um, soil is the second largest carbon sink um, just behind the oceans. Um, and it's very interesting that you know, our, basically our soils have been so highly degraded that when a lot of people have think about this question of how do we ameliorate climate change, repairing our soils not only will make it easier for us to grow the crops that we want to grow, to feed people, um, not only will it lead to kind of, you know, decreased nutrient um, needs, um, but it will also help with climate change. Um, so it really is a win-win-win. Um, so again, the way that this kind of cycling works, you all can look at this um, this kind of this graphic. But um, you know, plants will take up CO2. Um, they use that as their building blocks um, to create the sugars that are in their in their plant tissues. Um, and then as that decomposition happens, it drops into again, it gets maintained into the soil as soil organic matter. Some of that will get taken up again uh, through um, trees, plants, um, as nutrient cycling, um, and some of it will leach out, but, you know, some of it will actually stay there for a very long time. Um, and so, you know, our hope is always, it's not, um, there's a, there's a conversation right now when we think about kind of soil carbon or soil organic matter is, you know, is it really about hoarding soil organic matter and trying to collect as much as you can or, 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 or how do we use it? How do we cycle it? Um, and that is, that's an important piece of this. Um, so um, what does this look like at the UCSC Center for Agroecology? So we have um, a really interesting kind of side-by-side -side trial of this, even though we've never, I'd say, done research on it or really explored it. But this is what I would say is um, I'd put into the kind of 
this is the this is the farmer research report on um, soil organic carbon or soil organic matter. Um, uh, and what the slides you see here are basically there's the tractor tilled fields in the top slide. There is the hand tilled or in the farm garden beds. That's in the in the middle slide, and then at the bottom is the blueberries. Um, so these these three areas are really, you know, within throwing distance of each other. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, 50 feet of each other on the farm. So all exactly the same soil type. Um, and what's interesting is that um, while all of them are managed in, I'd say, you know, an agroecological way in a way that really is trying to enhance soil ecology, um, in the tractor fields, we can really only maintain about two to three percent soil organic matter, right? And again, half of that is going to be your carbon, um, the soil organic carbon. In the hand tilled beds, they can actually raise that up to about three to four percent. Um, and in the blueberries, where there's been no tillage at all and there's constant additions of um, mulch of chip, you know, wood chips um, and compost, um, we're actually able to raise up to seven to ten percent. So. Um, this is really a function of this is where um, it's a function of how how much are you working the soil um, and in working the soil we oftentimes I like to give the anecdote, although it doesn't work that well these days I think for younger students of like a wood burning stove because I think a lot of the younger students in on campus right now don't even know what a wood burning stove is but for those of us that maybe have been around wood burning stoves or or, or something I, I talk about it a lot as um, you know, that air intake valve on the wood burning stove. And so the wood is really your soil organic matter. Um, and what we're trying to do is get increase that soil organic matter. Um, but by tilling the soil, um, we're basically adding air, we're warming up the soil. And what that does is it really um, increases the soil microbial activity that breaks that soil organic matter down. Now that's not always a bad thing because in the process of breaking it down, they're going to release all these nutrients, which is what you need for your crops. So the analogy to the wood burning stove is that, you know, you're at home, you pack your wood burning stove at night at seven o'clock with all this wood, you get it burning. You want to have that air valve open just a little bit, right? The analogy is you want kind of just enough tillage, but not too much. Um, if you open that air all the way, you'd burn that wood really hot, that wood burning stove would let off a ton of heat, you'd be sweating in your bed, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, but come one or two in the morning, there's no more fuel in the, in the stove and you get cold, you've burnt up all your, all your fuel. And the same thing will happen in, um, in, um, in, a, in, a, in a farm system where, you know, if you overtill your soil, you can actually burn up that organic matter. So again, you know, in the tractor cultivated field, we're just limited in terms of the tractors do a level of work that exceeds what you can do on a hand scale, which is why the hand tilled beds are able to maintain kind of higher levels of that soil organic matter. Um, and then the blueberries, again, without any tillage and the organic amendments, um, you can see you can really raise that. So again, why this is kind of getting back, I see some kind of things in the chat. And again, I'll get to the, the applied nature of, um, of why this all matters. But here it is. Why does organic matter actually matter in, in garden soil? Um, and here's the thing, you know, as you increase your soil organic matter, um, there's a water conservation piece. Um, so you can actually store more water. Not only will your water, will your soil drain better, but it will also hold more water. Um, than it would without that soil organic matter. Um, you can, as you increase your soil organic matter, um, you can reduce your fertilizer inputs because again, that soil organic matter, which another way that I like to describe it is it's just comp it's basically compost that's been made in the soil and stays in the soil. Um, as you build up your amounts of that, it will slowly release over time, um, feeding your crops. Um, and so we estimate that for kind of every 1% of soil organic matter that you have in your soil, you can estimate somewhere between, you know, 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, and when you think about what most crops need, you know, a lettuce crop will need about, you know, 100 to 120 pounds of nitrogen. Um, and a broccoli crop will need about 200 to 250 pounds of nitrogen. So you can see with the soil that's sitting around four to 5% organic matter, you're, you're really close to meeting just about any crops needs um, with just what's in the soil without needing to add anything extra. Um, 
So, um, you know, this, it will help you um, kind of sustain higher yields. Um, this will help you reduce your weed pressure. And, um, and I like this last one, um, it's easier on the body. Um, this soil organic matter is really important in terms of your soil aggregation, like we'll get to later. And, and what that really means is like when you go out into your backyard and you go to dig your soil, is the soil easy to dig or is it hard to dig? And if it's easy to dig, chances are you've got a lot of soil organic matter in your soil. If it's hard to dig, chances are you don't have that much. Um, so this is, this is kind of why it matters. Not only does it matter as it relates to climate change, but it also really matters for you in your home garden, you know, for your body and your own success. Um, so again, we're going to go a little bit, I, I won't spend too much, I'm not seeing too many hits in the chat of like, I'm loving the soil science or soil science is where I want to stay focused. So maybe I'll go a little bit more quickly through this and we'll get to some of the applied nature of it. Um, but really basic soil science, like what is soil? When you scoop up a handful of soil, what is it? Um, and we oftentimes talk about that the ideal soil is basically um, half of it is the actual soil itself. Um, and half of it is a combination of air and water. And when we talk about plants being in the ideal scenario to grow, um, that air and water exists in the pore spaces of the soil. So we say that half of the pores would be filled with air and half of the pores would be filled with water. Um, and that would be kind of ideal. So, um, so on, the, on the actual soil itself, right, most of that is gonna be the mineral particles. Um, and then there's going to be a small slice that's organic matter. 10% of that is going to be the actual things that are alive. You know, some of that is going to be the actual, the living roots from your plants. And some of it is going to be our soil humus. Um, and that again is, is what we kind of will generally refer to as soil organic matter um, uh, in our soil. Um, so uh, again, when we talk about the mineral particles, um, the, it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, oftentimes we think about how small sand is, um, the fine grains of sand, but when we think about the mineral particles with, that are our options in soil, um, sand is actually kind of relatively giant, right? It's like the sun in the solar system. My son's really into solar systems right now, so I'm gonna pull out some solar system analogies. But the sand is like the sun and the silt is like mercury, right? The silt um, and the clay are just these tiny particles in relation to sand. Um, and so it is going to be really important when you're thinking about how you manage your soil um, is to really understand what your soil type is. And um, the soil type is going to be a combination. It's basically what percentages of all these different particle sizes do you have um, in your in your soil. So soil type or soil texture is going to be um, kind of the percentage. So this is a mason jar soil test that you can do. Um, it's really fun, especially if you've got kids that you can do where basically you take a, a small amount of soil, put in a mason jar with some water, shake it up, and then based on the particle size, these different soil particles are going to filter out. And you can estimate what percent of each of these things that you have, um, either kind of like by your eye or, or use a ruler. Um, but this is a nice kind of like hands-on science way to do it. Um, the other way you could do is you could send it out to a lab for an actual kind of soil analysis, but you know, those can be a little bit pricier. Um, here, this is a classic soil texture chart um, that basically looks, you know, when I say on the farm, we have a sandy loam, um, you would, you know, we're in that kind of red category at the bottom, which means that we have somewhere between, right, like 45-ish and maybe 20% clay. Um, but a much higher percentage of sand and then kind of a, and a much higher percentage of silt um, as our soil particles. Um, one thing that's really important, and I think that this might be really instructive for a lot of people, is that, you know, a lot of times when I talk to home gardeners, they're like, oh, I can never grow anything in my soil because it's just clay. I know it's just clay. It's so hard. Um, and the thing that I always push back on is that you know, no matter, like, if you come out to the farm and it's dry, right, like it's dry right now and you dig up some soil, it's going to feel like clay. It's going to feel like, you know, you were working clay for pottery and then it dried and it's this big hunk of clay. But what you really need to do to really understand your soil texture is you really need to get it wet and you really need to work it in your hand, um, not when it's saturated, but when it, imagine like it had rained and then you waited two or three days that's when you really need to feel your soil to get an understanding of kind of what it is. Um, but this mason jar um, test can help you see that kind of right away. 
Um, so I think that's really interesting for, I think for you all to know in terms of, you know, if you've already given up on a section of your soil, um, just know that it might be really low in organic matter. It might have really bad soil aggregation, um, but it's not, it's not just that your soil is doomed in terms of what it is. So that's soil texture. So now let's get into soil structure. So soil structure is, this is what you're able to change about your soil, right? So this is when the particles of the soil themselves actually aggregate together. Um, and in that aggregation, they create these kind of micropores and macropores. Um, and that's where your roots are gonna grow, right? The roots aren't gonna actually like grow into a mineral particle. They're gonna grow around it in these areas. Um, and so this is an example, you know, Again, we can get a little bit more in detail to this, but you know, all the particles of soil um, are negatively charged. And um, so they have um, some natural kind of um, ability to kind of repel each other, but there's enough kind of positively charged um, cations in the soil that can help bind these together. And also one of the most important things that binds the soil together is some of these exudates that come from, you know, worm castings and, and the things that the little microbes, the bacteria and the fungi, as they eat and poop and dissolve, you know, these things that they create, those are kind of the glues that can really hold your soil together um, and give it kind of a, a fluffy nature. Um, so again, here is just another example of it. Um, where you can see the difference in kind of the, the pores and, and these soil organic matter grains. The, the important thing to know is that clay particles, um, you know, they have a tremendous amount of surface area. Um, and when you think about the actual, the humus particles themselves have even more so than clay. So when you talk about a soil kind of nutrient holding capacity and water holding capacity, so much more of it comes from this soil organic matter that we're talking about, this humus, um, than actually comes from the soil particles themselves. And that's, again, even though it's such a small percentage of the soil, again, in that kind of 5% slice, anywhere from, you know, 4 to 6%, um, it can have such a big impact on, on the soil and the productivity of the soil. Um, so again, going um, a little bit into the kind of chemistry of things, um, this is a, um, you know, again, I mentioned the clay particles are all negatively charged. Um, the, what that allows is that it holds on to a lot of the cations that we need in our soil that we need for the plants. Um, and that by holding on to those particles, the plants then can access them, um, you know, pull them off and, and, and use them in the soil. Um, the, let's see, oh, that slide's not in here. The one, the one important thing, this, this might be later in the, in the slide, but the one important factor about this is that, you know, there's one, um, there's one nutrient that doesn't, that isn't really a cation, especially of our macronutrients, our nitrogen, our phosphorus, and our potassium, um, and that's nitrogen. Nitrogen exists oftentimes in a negative state in the soil, um, and so when it exists as nitrate and it's negatively charged, if you have a negative, um, negatively charged nitrate and you have negative not negative charges on your clay particles, um, they're gonna push themselves apart. They're not gonna stick to the soil. Um, it can, and because it's, um, because it's a charged particle, it will dissolve really well in water. So this is where um, you would actually get a lot of you know, leaching of nitrogen. And that's kind of the, that's one of the hardest nutrients to manage in a system um, because of that negative, negative charge. Um, Okay, so again, the soil organic matter, we've kind of covered this, um, has um, these kind of really important um, properties, but the soil itself, so there's the living things that are in the soil, that really small slice, and that's, again, the decomposers, which are kind of the big folks that we see, the earthworms, um, the, some of you in the nematodes. Um, there's the kind of the saprophytes, and those are basically the ones that we can't see that work on decomposed material. And then there's the symbionts. And those are the ones that actually form these relationships with the plants themselves that help them access the nutrients um, in the soil. So we're gonna, maybe I'll spend just a little bit longer on, on soil organic matter. Um, well, no, we, we can kind of jump to cover crops. The, the most important thing is that, you know, when we talk about, I was just talking about this with a class that was out in the field, you know, we really talk about cover crops being the backbone of 
um, our organic farming systems. Um, I, I have a really hard time imagining farming without cover crops. And I know that there's a lot of growers, especially in California, some of them are really hesitant to use cover crops for a number of reasons, um, to typically older growers or, you know, conventional growers, but, you know, we, we see it again as the real backbone. And, and I, and it, this really just relates back to, again, their impact on soil organic matter, um, because, and this is going to get to some of the, I won't get too deep into it unless folks um, really, I think, prod me in the question and answer section. But um, when we talk about soil organic matter, right, so it's this stuff, right, you think about it again as like compost in your soil. So stuff that, you know, a clipping of grass and biomass, you know, leftover leaves of lettuce that get turned out of the, over in the soil, get eaten up, and then somehow stay in the soil. What we used to think and what soil scientists used to think is that, oh, if you, there's a difference between turning in something like a fresh leaf of lettuce and something like a tall um, strand of straw, right? So, or grass that's gone dry or browned out as we say it. So, you know, straw is really woody. Um, it's really, um, you know, you, you can imagine it's really hard, hard to decompose. Um, and we used to think that, oh, if you turn these two things in, the straw will contribute more to long-term soil organic matter because it will take a lot longer for it to break down. Um, but as scientists have kind of dug deeper and deeper into understanding what actually happens in the soil, um, what they've really found is that even though those, those straw pieces um, will take longer to break down in the soil, um, we're really talking about, you know, maybe it's a matter of, you know, months or years for them to break down. Um, you know, like that lettuce leaf will break down and become available to the plant, you know, probably in three months in the summer. Um, but that straw, it might take it six months, nine months, or maybe two years, but it doesn't actually contribute that long to that kind of longer term soil organic matter that, you know, when we're talking about five, 10, 15 years, when you're really trying to build up those reserves. And what they found, what it, what it really takes is it's actually the, the root activity of plants. Um, and so when we talked about that carbon cycle and how much carbon, you know, the plants will pull in all this CO2 and then via photosynthesis, turn it into sugars and use it in their bodies. But actually, in some instances, up to 40 or 50 percent of the carbon that they're pulling out of the atmosphere, they're actually pumping into the soil as root exudates to feed the microbes that are doing the magic in the soil to help them access nutrients. So in some ways, it's like we're farming the plants, but the plants are farming the microbes. Um, and, and they found that it's those pathways through that kind of promotion of microbial life and the decomposition of those microbes that you might think, oh my gosh, those things are so tiny, they're microscopic. Um, they're the ones that are gonna become so easily accessible and dissolve and that's probably a super fast cycling, but those are actually the ones that can really contribute to long-term soil organic matter um, in, in your soil. So the bottom line here, again, for I think the home gardener is that you know these cover crops you know, what I tell, you know, I live on the same property as my uh, mother-in-law and, and she loves to garden. And she's always like, Daryl, what, what do we do? What should we do? And I'm always like, just if, if we can have plants growing in the soil for as long as possible, that's going to be the best thing for it. And um, that's really looking at um, kind of how, um, yeah, again, how, um, how to really improve your soil. Um, okay, so let's get into cover crops. Um, and then again, you know, I'm getting a hint that we're going to talk a little bit more about the applied stuff. So we'll go through this, but cover crops, a lot like soil organic matter, I think are, they're one of these things that's just like, it's good all around, right? Um, so it adds this organic matter into your soil. They really work as um, weed suppression. They'll protect your soil when we actually do have rain here. Um, they can really loosen up hard soil. Um, where I used to farm with Kirsten before I started working at um, the Center for Agroecology is that we worked on the marine terraces just south of Davenport on old Brussels sprout fields that had been managed conventionally for kind of over 40 years. Um, those soils were so beat down that it took us, um, that they really didn't act the way that we wanted them to, right? So when you talk about having that hard soil in your backyard that you can't dig into, right? Like that's what we saw in the springtime. Um, but what was amazing to us is that using cover crops, basically three years of cover cropping and trying to be mindful of our tillage, we really saw that soil change from what felt like a really hard clay to the actual clay loam that it was. So 
what, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, in your garden where you have, you might have this really hard soil, um, the, I think these cover crops can really help. And in our area, you really want to take advantage of the cover crops um, in the planting them in the fall um, and growing them up through the winter. Um, again, there you can have lots of different goals in cover cropping. Um, oh, sorry, folks. One second. Here. I have a, a kid intruder. Hold on one second. <laughs> All right. All right, folks, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, we're all trying to do a little bit of everything these days, right? Um, okay, so there's lots of different goals you can have in cover cropping. I think, um, you know, for most of you all in your backyards, your really real goal is going to be how do I improve my crops? Um, how do I improve my soil? And and just about any cover crop should help you do that. Um, if you want to be a little bit more kind of quantitative about it, you could take soil tests and send them in. Um, my sense is that, you know, in most, it's probably unnecessary in most home gardens. You know, especially if you have soil that hasn't been kind of cropped intensively, um, your soil is probably going to have what it needs to really um, produce a crop. But again, if anybody wants this, I'm going to open up a big can of worms here. But if anybody wants to take soil tests and send them to me, I love looking at these. I love talking about them. Yeah. Um, but let's look at a couple different. Let's look at a couple different cover crops. So, um, legume cover crops: these are your fava beans, bell beans, field peas, vetch, um, clovers. Um, the main thing that you're going to get with these is that they're going to add nitrogen um, to your soil. So these are these, this magic plant um, that basically can take this atmospheric nitrogen. So our atmosphere is a majority nitrogen, um, but that nitrogen is held up in these triple bonds um, and plants can't access it. But there's these really cool bacteria. These are the symbionts, right? These bacteria that will grow on legume roots. Um, and they will actually take that nitrogen, that atmospheric, that gaseous nitrogen, um, turn it into a form that plants can use and, and give it to the plant. So when you grow these cover crops, um, you grow these cover crops, they're using nitrogen that they've taken from the atmosphere. When you turn those cover crops back into your soil, and that's the important thing, that nitrogen will then be available in a plant, in a plant form um, for your next crop. Um, yeah, and that we just kind of uh, went over that. Um, Cereals, so these are going to be your grasses. Um, these are really good in terms of improving your kind of soil structure because of how much um, root activity, these fibrous roots that they have, um, they really do a great job of mellowing out soil. So taking that really hard, chunky soil and really mellowing it out. Um, they will create a lot of biomass and a lot of kind of carbonaceous biomass. So the one real challenge with these, you know, oats, rye, winter wheat, the challenge with these is that you have to knock them down early enough or have a compost pile that you can really um, take care of. Um, great question in the chat. Do you recommend inoculating legume cover crops? Um, it's not necessary. Most soils will have kind of native inoculum. Um, so it's not really necessary to buy extra. Um, but I know, you know, our seed, they just, it just comes coated with it. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a bad thing if it has coating on it already, if, it, if they've already kind of tossed it. Um, but I really don't think it's necessary. Um, and then other cover crops are going to be your brassicas. So this is, you know, kind of mustards or radishes. Um, these are really, um, you know, these probably, I'll go back and forth. If you have a section that you want to cover crop really quickly, you know, mustard is, is a kind of a quick cover crop. But I think for a home gardener, you're going to get a lot better bang for your buck with um, some legumes and grasses than mustards. The one real challenge of mustards is that they can get out of control pretty quick. Um, if you let them flower and go to seed, they can become a perennial weed in your garden, um, specifically the black mustards. Um, the white mustards are a little bit easier to control. Um, but, you know, I think, again, on a home garden scale, um, you know, using something that's, again, more, has more legumes than it's going to give you, going to be a little bit better. <clears throat> um, yeah, again, here are some, some different um, ideas about mustards. Um, buckwheat is a really great one for the summertime. And this is a really great one for pollinators, especially if you have a lot of fruit trees. Um, so it's really fast growing. We call this like a, you know, a 40 to 50 day crop. Basically, by the time we plant it to the time that it flowers and is ready for us to turn in, it's about 45 days. So 
this is something that, you know, if you have a gap in your planting in your garden and you want to, again, keep stuff going, buckwheat's a really great option. The flowers are incredibly fragrant. Some people really don't like the smell, um, but they are really fragrant and they're really beautiful. Um, but this is a, it's really easy to kill and incorporate this residue. Um, it kind of dissolves right away. So um, yeah, cover crop is, is great. Um, this is an example of uh, buckwheat that's grown kind of in a garden plot. I think this is maybe Delisa's. Um, and then Phasalia is a great one. Um, this is a California native um, for pollinators. Um, again, really nice um, uh, to grow in the fall, but um, you know, you're not gonna get quite as much biomass um, from this and, it, and this will perennialize really easily. So you need to be careful with incorporation. Mm. Um, so looking at cover crops, you know, diversity is really, we, <laughs> so we've been planting cover crops on a farm for decades. Um, it's been a real standard of organic growers in our area to plant, plant these mixes that are basically a majority legume. Um, so by weight, you know, they're probably, you know, 90 to 95% legumes. Um, and then a little bit of grasses thrown in um, for some type of diversity. And that's what you see in this picture. You see the grasses growing up. You do see some brassicas in this one too, and also the legumes. Um, and this is what I would recommend, I think, for your all's gardens um, is just what they, sometimes they're calling it a soil builder mix, but it basically has um, a bunch of bell beans, um, a bunch of vetch, um, but then just a little bit of, you know, either rye or triticale or something um, that's a grass um, that will give you some diversity. Um, if you want to, you can really go straight legumes. That's going to decompose a lot faster and be easier. Um, but the grasses will help give you some kind of weed competition uh, early. Um, I see a question about um, are the are is the is are some of the um, cover crops actually edible? Um, some of them you probably could. They're not bred to be edible. Um, although you know most of them probably won't poison you, but don't take my word for it. Um, the main problem that you're going to run into, and the important thing about cover crops, is that you want to grow them out basically until they're flowering, until they're just about to flower, and that's when you want to turn them in. Mm -hmm. To the point at which they're creating seeds or seeds that you would eat, they're going to lock up all those nutrients that you're wanting for your next year's crop into those seeds, um, and so they're not going to do, not going to give you quite as much benefit as if you turn them in. Um, so you really want to think about that cover crop's not for you; it's for the soil. You got to feed the soil to feed your plant. Um, so here's a really quick and dirty about cover crops. If you all haven't done it, how do you do it? Um, you want to clear and rough up your soil, um, broadcast your seed, and that can really look like just sprinkling it from your hand and an even distribution around your farm or around your, around your garden. Um, you could rake it in with a hula hoe or dust it lightly with soil compost. Um, ideally, you press it and then water it well. Um, what I should say is that a lot of these weeds are really hardy and this these, these kind of, you know, there are optional steps here um, to actually germinate it. I really wouldn't recommend, you know, if you've got a lot of time on your hands, that can be a good strategy, but um, oftentimes that's a little bit overkill. Um, or covering with a light sprinkle of straw mulch. What I do at my house, which has, you know, some soil that's really nice and some soil that's really, really bad that was basically driven over like a parking lot, is rather than do any of those steps, I really just sprinkle it, I sprinkle a cover crop out and then put a really thick layer of straw down ahead of a big rain. And that straw provides enough cover and moisture retention that normally those seeds will germinate um, and will have a really nice cover crop stand um, by the springtime. So it can really be pretty low effort. Um, if you're in your actual garden beds, then yeah, put a little extra effort in to rough up the soil surface, put them in, rake those seeds in and, and maybe cover them. Um, but if you're really trying to, you know, start on a patch that's too hard, um, don't be afraid to just, you know, cover crop it and then try working that soil um, in the springtime when you have some good moisture. Um, there's a couple different techniques that um, I'm just checking on time. I might um, kind of gloss over these a little bit. Um, but these are strategies basically for um, terminating your cover crop. Um, so these are really used in kind of lower no-till situations. Um, so, you know, cardboard as a way of, so occultation, right, you think of the occult, right? It's basically about darkness or, or um, you know, taking out light. So what you can do is you could knock down your cover crop, you know, when, again, when it comes to that flowering stage, um, you can knock it down, you could put cardboard on top of it. Um, that will really suppress the weeds um, and eventually, and you can layer 
kind of um, compost on top of it. Um, and eventually that cardboard will just decompose into the soil and it will become new soil and your plants will grow through it. Um, another option you can use is this black silage tarping is becoming really popular among some smaller growers. Um, where basically it's this picture that's up in the right hand corner. Um, and it will really help things break down very fast. Um, but you, so you put it over your garden bed after you've grown your cover crop, knock it down, put the occultation tarp on top. Um, and that will really speed up decomposition of that um, cover crop. And then when you pull that tarp back, you should be just about ready to plant. Um, so it looks like we're getting into the kind of, um, yeah, some of these specifics of growing. So again, as I've mentioned, winter planting on the central coast, you know, through October to December. Um, here, I would really emphasize that if you are thinking about planting your cover crop for your next spring, try to get your cover crops in by mid to late October. Um, and I say that, you know, typically we wait for rain and for the last 10 years, we haven't had rain until the middle of November. Um, but if you can afford to use the water um, and just a little bit, will get your cover crops up and growing so that when it rains, those cover crops are in the ground. Basically waiting a month between plantings can equate to, you know, probably 10 to 20 times more biomass for your plants, especially this time of year. Um, so again, even if we don't see rain on the horizon, I really recommend, I think on a home garden scale, planting those cover crops in kind of mid to late October. Um, yeah, and leave it in the ground through the rainy season. And then you start checking it kind of late February. You know, oftentimes we're not incorporating our cover crop until, you know, middle of April um, because we would have so much rain. But these days it's all a little bit over the place. So now here are some specifics on kind of when to cut your cover crop. Um, so, you know, these ideas of if you want pollinators, let it bloom. But if you want nitrogen, you know, cut it down either just before the flowers bloom or right in when it's in full bloom. Um, if you really want the biomass, you want something to throw in a compost pile, you can let it go a little bit longer so it gets a little bit, um, you know, darker. Um, your, the ratio of carbon and nitrogen is going to change as your cover crop progresses so that it's going to be more carbonaceous the more mature it gets. Um, but at that point, you're really thinking, going to think about taking it off and putting it into a, um, into a compost pile. Um, so here's the steps, I think, for knocking down. So cut your cover crop with the soil line with a shovel, weed whip, or scythe. Um, leave the roots in the ground. You don't need to dig them out. They will decompose and, and do wonders for your soil. Um, you can chop up your kind of green tops with a shovel um, or whatever you have. Um, and then this is kind of your choice, right? You can either um, dig the cover crop in. That's this picture on the left where you see the chopped up cover crop in the garden bed. And now the process of digging has happened where um, this is kind of a, a double digging process that looks like that's going on where you're going to incorporate some compost, but really just turn over that cover crop into your soil. Um, option two is to compost. So basically you can um, take all your tops off of your garden bed, put them in a compost pile to decompose, um, kind of wait a week and then, um, you know, sprinkle compost or plant right back into that. Um, depending on your cover crops, you may have some regrowth in that situation. Um, and uh, option three is this kind of chop and drop. So um, chop all your cover crop up, leave it on the surface, and then cover it with this black plastic or cardboard for two to three weeks for it to decompose and then plant directly into it. I think this chop and drop idea is really, um, you know, especially for folks that don't have, you know, if you're not willing to be out there digging deep in the soil, um, this is a real way to, um, I think, you know, get the benefits of cover crop um, with relatively low effort. Um, because again, you can put on top of the soil those black plastics or that cardboard does a great job of decomposing um, the cover crop and making those beds ready to plant. Um, it also does a really great job of preserving your moisture. So if you do that at the right time in spring when you still have moisture in your soil, um, you're going to be able to maintain that moisture even when we haven't had rain. And then when you're ready to plant, you pull that tarp off um, and the soil is in kind of perfect condition. So here's an example if folks aren't, aren't really familiar with like how to turn your soil. It's really just like it says, stick a shovel in it, flip that shovel over, turn it upside down. Um, you can get a fork in there and kind of maybe break up some of the, the larger aggregates, um, but just turning that cover crop in, burying the greens so that 
the microbes can do their work and start the decomposition process and you've actually uprooted the cover crops, um, that's really all you need to do. Um, here's an example of the chop and drop. So here's some buckwheat um, that was chopped down and then the tarp was pulled over it. And then a couple weeks later, when you pull that tarp off, you see that those are all the stems that are left over from the decomposed buckwheat. Um, and you could just rake those off and then plant right into that bed. Um, so here's an example, right? The broccoli plant was planted right into that residue or you could kind of you know, pull some of the weeds back. What you see that kind of bottom picture, the bottom left-hand picture, that's, those are weeds that, one other thing about the occultation and those tarps is that when you put it on top, it will warm up the soil so that, and there's enough moisture so that weeds will actually germinate, but because they don't have light, they basically blanch. So they, um, they get white because they're not creating chlorophyll because they don't have any light um, and then they die. So not only with that occultation are you going to flush weeds and help control your weed pressure, but you're also going to um, yeah, be able to take care of your cover crop. Um, and then the last thing you can do is you can put your chickens to work, right? If you got some, this is, and this is what we would do. This is what we do at my house is we just let the chickens run out over the cover crops and eat them. Um, and we actually grow cover crops for our chickens um, and kind of rotate them through. So um, this is, yeah, this is a really fun thing to do. Um, Okay, I think, um, yeah, I think we've gone through it all, um, thinking about cover crops and thinking about soil. Um, and I was hoping that we would have a good amount of time for questions and answers so that I think we could get to some of these maybe direct questions that you all have about, you know, how do we apply these things in my specific garden situation? Um, yeah, so I think at this point, we take questions. Yeah, does that sound right, Jono? That sounds great, yeah. We've already answered a bunch, but um, there are endless questions, no doubt. Yeah, okay. And I'm seeing questions in the chat and in the Q&A. So maybe let's focus them in the Q&A. And I think there's a, um, that way we can like, I can, yeah. Mm -hmm. We can, I can check it as answered. Okay. Um, okay, question. I sowed cover crop in December and nothing germinated. Was it too cold? Probably not. Um, a lot of the cover crops that we sow, if they were cover crops that you bought from a store, any of those ones that I'd mentioned, um, those are all cover crops that will germinate in really cool temperatures. So um, chances are, you know, depending on when it was in December, maybe they didn't have enough water, maybe they had too much water, um, but my guess is that it wasn't enough water. That's normally the case um, uh, for cover crop germination, um, or they're just too superficial. It's it's hard to to get these things too wet. You know, it's like when we sow we sowed our cover crop at the end of November when there was. Um, uh, or the end of October when we got like that six or seven inches of rain all in one shot um, and the cover crops did fine. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm just realizing, I, I was just talking, I wasn't looking, I realized I'm like in a dark hole now. So hold on, let me turn on some light. <laughs> okay. Uh, John, do you wanna feed some of these questions we've been capturing uh, yeah. to Daryl? Yeah, Right. okay, Daryl. Here's a question, a weed question. I have oxalis everywhere. If I chop it and drop it and leave it in the soil, will the soil get too much oxalic acid? I'm sorry, what was the, what was, what was the first part? What is it? Uh, weed question, oxalis? oxalis everywhere. If I chop and drop it and leave it in the soil, will the soil get too much oxalic acid? Yeah, I don't think you have to worry about too much oxalic acid. Um, you're, just the oxalis is more of the problem. Um, and I, I think the question is, is it winter oxalis or summer oxalis? So there's winter oxalis, um, it's like sour grass, um, mm -hmm. has the yellow flowers that only shows up during the winter. That is much less of a problem. The summer oxalis um, can be really challenging in gardens. We have it in the farm garden and it really prevents us from growing a lot of different things. It's a weed that we have not conquered and I don't have good suggestions on how to conquer it. Um, because basically it, um, it, yeah, it's just almost impossible to manage. Um, you, what I may recommend is actually using one of these silage tarps in the garden. Um, but if you can sacrifice a section of the garden for like two years, 
um, like really let it be covered for, you know, almost that long and see if that can, can help it. But we haven't found any strategies um, to manage summer oxalis in our gardens. Great. Then another one um, is, uh, oh, go ahead. Um, well, I don't, uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Do you recommend the same procedure for planting cover crops around perennials? Yeah, absolutely. You know, fruit trees, um, roses, um, you know, anything ornamental, you know, this is where it becomes kind of an aesthetic preference too um, for your garden. Um, you know, in terms of the soil health and the plant health, these cover crops are going to be beneficial for the plants. They're not going to compete with them for resources. Um, so, um, yeah, I would, I would definitely recommend it from a kind of soil health perspective. You know, that said, if your perennial plant is growing and it's been growing there for a long time, it may not need those benefits, right? The root activity of that perennial may be doing enough of, on its own, like a big sage or something like that. So I think it kind of depends on what perennials you're talking about. Um, but when we think about it, you know, we think about, um, yeah, mainly our orchard crops and we always cover crop our alleyways, you know, Oren, when he can, he always puts little rings of cover crops around the trees. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just thinking about what I was talking about before with how beneficial it is to have more of those living um, roots in the soil, those living plants in the soil, as much as you can do that, the better. Great. So then um, do you have any recommendations for growing summer cover crops in drought, very dry conditions? Yeah, this is where you would look for specific cover crops, um, especially if you didn't, if you didn't or couldn't, if you didn't want to or couldn't use that much water. Um, Sudan grass um, or Sudan sorghum is a great drought tolerant um, cover crop and is really good for, um, yeah, for soil health. So um, it's one of those things, you know, one foot way folks will use Sudan grass in the summer is, you know, sow it, you'll have to water it to get it germinated, but you could water it probably once a month. Um, and it would put on a ton of biomass. Um, so it would grow really tall. And then if you have, you know, a mower or a weed whip, you just treat it like a lawn, um, you know, you could just mow it back or cut it down and it'll regrow. Um, and you can do that for, for a while until you're ready to use those beds. Um, if you do that, all that, you know, Sudan grass, we chop it down when it gets maybe like six to eight feet tall. Um, and at that point, if you chop it and you don't incorporate it right away, um, it will turn into straw. So in that situation, you need to think about raking it off and putting it into a compost pile or something like that. Great. Um, let's see, next one. Can you explain soil texture versus soil structure? Yeah, soil texture is what you got. Soil texture is um, what you can change. So the soil texture is the specific percentages of the sand, silt, and clay that you have at your, you know, on your land. And it's gonna be, it's nearly impossible to change that, right? Aside from like shipping in, right? Truckloads of sand. Um, but chances are like whatever soil texture you have is actually gonna be really good, right? It's gonna be, it's gonna be the rare example that there's gonna be some soil that you, you can't work with. Um, so um, yeah, so that's soil texture. Soil structure is how are those particular soil particles aggregated? And that relates to, you know, how have you worked the soil. So if you if you are working the soil when it's too wet, if you're smearing soil on your on your shovel or smearing it on your hands, that's a good indication that the soil is too wet. And what you're doing is you're actually compressing any aggregates and destroying your soil structure. Um, and then the other thing, the thing that we've been talking about is is all this cover cropping, um, you know, having living plants in the soil. That's how you're going to really improve your soil structure because you're going to be increasing your soil organic matter. Great. Uh, any experience with comfrey as a cover crop? Um, no, I mean, comfrey is a, we have it a lot in the Chadwick garden. It was planted originally as a medicinal and now it's a little bit out of control as kind of like a weed. Yeah. Um, so I would just say, you know, be careful with experimenting with some of these things because they might perennialize themselves and, and make their way into other areas of your garden. But I don't know anybody that's doing comfrey specifically as a cover crop for any particular benefits, um, but I'm sure it does something, right? Even the weeds do something. So, you know, who am I to say? But if you wanted to follow something that's more tried and tried and true, you know, I would go with something again, bell beans. Vetches, I think are really great in orchards. 
um, because they put on so much biomass and can contribute so much nitrogen. Um, and um, yeah, it, they're just kind of a great kind of, yeah, bushy plant. Um, well, is it possible to have too much cover crop that will affect production of fruit or on fruit trees? Um, I think the main issue that you're going to worry about, the short answer is no, um, mainly because they're not going to be competing for resources at the same time if you're doing a winter cover crop. Um, because again, most of our, the fruit trees in our area are going to go dormant during the winter, which is when your cover crops are going to grow. Um, so I think you'd really only see benefits. The one area that you would see drawbacks is if you, and this is something that we're experimenting with on the farm currently, is that if you let those cover crops um, go to maturity, because we're experimenting with some kind of no-till practices and um, roller crimping some large cover, some really mature cover crop. If you let that cover crop mature too much, um, they will draw lots of water out of the soil to the point that they could stress your trees out. But if you're talking about knocking these cover crops down, again, anywhere between February and April, um, you should be just fine. And I think it'll only be additive. Again, and when you talk about like the legumes that we would use, you know, those should be they'll oftentimes be generating a lot of their own nitrogen from the atmosphere. So they won't, and they'll do some, some work in scavenging the nitrogen and kind of holding it in place so that when you chop it down and you could just lay that cover crop on a mulch around the trees, lay that down as a mulch around the trees, um, it'll get back to the trees um, and you shouldn't worry about competition. All right. And, and here's another question that's sort of, um, addressing soils, but um, plant health as well. Um, I have plants that are getting round brown spots. I'm guessing there's something in the soil that is overwintering. What can I do to the soil to get rid of whatever is causing them? Round brown spots? That's, that's um, yeah. On, that's on, like is that on cover crop? Um, I say, or don't think it my, is. My, my, okay. Yeah, it's hard to say, you know, with soil-borne diseases, um, well, with diseases in general, in our, it, it's just really hard to know exactly what the what they are unless you send them out for a lab. Um, if it was on bell beans or something, my guess is it sounds like chocolate spot, um, which again is an issue on bell beans, but normally it's not an issue so much that it takes away from the productivity of the cover crop, but yeah, I'd have to know more, yeah. Yeah. And that's a no more to answer that better. Okay. Um, just moved to San Jose and converted a pebble covered path into usable soil, but it's very hard packed, lots of clay, have dumped some compost. So I will use cover crops in this fall. Any other suggestions for this soil? I mean, the main thing, the compost is great. Um, that will definitely help. But the main thing with those soils is just be patient with them. Um, those hard packed soils um, and, um, and really be careful to only work them at the right soil moisture. Um, and it's hard, you know, maybe in future workshops, I'll, I'll put a slide in about that, but um, what, when you, the right soil moisture is basically, it feels moist, but not saturated, not sopping wet. It shouldn't smear your hands too much. Um, and you should be able to crumble the soil um, somewhat nicely. Even when you have soils that are very poorly aggregated, at, at a level of moisture, they will still crumble. And that's what you're looking for. So, you know, my guess is um, sometimes what that requires is actually putting on water for, you know, maybe it's like with a, with a small sprinkler, you know, maybe two hours and do it at night um, where you're not gonna see a lot of evaporation and then wait into the next evening or potentially even the day after that, and then really check the moisture and see how far down it went. Um, because really you need that moisture evenly distributed in that soil to work it. Um, so my guess is if you're in San Jose, if you're trying to like dig that soil right now, it's gonna be rock hard. There's no way it's got enough moisture um, unless it was under mulch after the rains that we got previously. So you're probably gonna have to irrigate it to work it um, or hopefully wait for, a, for another spring rain. Um, until you work that soil. But yeah, just be patient. Um, again, in our area that we that was a parking lot, um, not an actual parking lot, but you know, where, where folks park cars, um, you know, we're not trying to crop it um, anytime soon, but just cover cropping it, turning a little bit loosely, um, that is, yeah, that, that's what you really need to do.
Um, but I think you'll be surprised once you get a cover crop on there, um, you'll be surprised the next year um, how much mellower it feels. Mm -hmm. um, question from earlier on, um, cover crops to break up hard pan, any suggestions? Yeah, I would, you know, there are some specific, people talk about tillage radishes being a thing. Those are more used in kind of like tractor systems. Um, but I really think, you know, any any mix of cover crops, is, it, honestly, I think is good. The grasses will do really good in terms of kind of their more fibrous root system, but, you know, your legumes will be just fine as well. So I would just recommend one of the soil building cover crop mixes. Um, and again, you know, it's this comment that I always hear of like, my soil is just rock hard. And that's probably mostly a function of soil moisture and irrigation and less a function of, you know, how good your soil is. Um, Cause again, any soil, no matter how bad it is, when you get it to the right moisture, you should be able to dig it um, and, and work it. Um, and, and you just got to hit it at the right time. But um, yeah, I think those, those soil builder cover crops are going to be great for that. All right. Um, is there any way to add mycorrhizal support to a home garden? Um, there are plenty of people that will sell you products um, to give to put that in your garden. Um, as far as you know, from the research community, there's really no consensus on whether those things are actually effective or not. Um, and it's really hard. Um, you know, unless you're adding it in perennial systems, you know, a lot of the it's hard to maintain those mycorrhizal networks um, in tillage-based systems. Um, there are some that will kind of regenerate on somewhat of an annual basis, but um, you know, our tillage disrupts a lot of those networks. So I think it's really hard to, it's hard to say. Um, again, I think lots of people will say it. There's lots of buzzwords around, you know, increasing your fungal to bacterial ratio in your soil, but um, I don't think there's any research right now to really support um, certain products or, or how we might do that. All right. And so um, another question, is there any value in Oxalis chop and drop? Is there any value in it? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, you want to get rid of it somehow. Um, you know, it, again, if it's, if it's the, if it's this winter Oxalis, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, what I would try to do with a winter oxalis, so I'm looking in the Q and A and I see if this is from Robin and it is winter oxalis and you have tons of it, um, just try to get your cover crop established earlier. Um, that will shade out the winter oxalis um, so that it will be less successful. Um, but even if the winter oxalis pokes up in the understory of the cover crops, that's not gonna be a big worry. It's not gonna outcompete your cover crops. So again, if it's winter oxalis, I would say you can live with it. Um, and um, and yeah, and, and kind of just go on to your cropping during the summer. Um, if you have a couple of, you know, winter garden beds that you're trying to work, um, then again, you'll have to do kind of a heavier weeding on those. But um, yeah, hopefully over time, kind of shading it out and doing some of that, um, maybe even that plastic tarping um, with the chop and drop, I think that could be beneficial. And is there another, another name for the summer oxalis? Um, I don't know the scientific name. I'd have to look it up. But um, yeah, we just, they, they have very different kind of, yeah, growth habits. Mm. Okay. And if you cover crop in an area that's a quarter acre orchard, what's the best way to manage it once it is already to chop it down? I mean, it, I think it really depends on what you want to do with that. Um, well, okay, so if it, you said a quarter acre orchard? Yes. Um, yeah, I would, just, I would just chop it and drop it. Honestly, if you're not planning to, to crop it, <laughs> um, then it, just go ahead and knock it down and you can just let it kind of decompose on the surface. Um, you know, you might be losing some of the nutrients in that process, but if you don't have the labor to put it into the ground, um, you're still going to get a lot of benefits from the root activity of the cover crops. And then that mulching of the cover crop is going to help for kind of weed suppression and things like that. Um, if you wanted to get really fancy, you could think about running like strips of that occultation tarp to help decompose that. But 
um, I think that's probably a little bit unnecessary. All right. Um, what's the word on gypsum? Do you recommend it at all as a soil amendment? Oh, fun. I love, yeah, great. Um, yeah, so gypsum is great. Um, a lot of farmers will use it on kind of a regular basis. Um, I think this just really depends on your soil type. And I really, I wouldn't recommend um, regular applications of gypsum unless you've actually looked at your, your soil test and there's some reason to, there's some reason to do that. So typically people are gonna add gypsum to increase your calcium in the soil. Um, and that's going to relate to like your base cation percentages, um, your base cation saturation percentages that you would see on a soil test. Um, and oftentimes, um, there can be a chemical component to your soil aggregation where if you have too much magnesium and not enough calcium, your soil, your soils can come across as they call them kind of sticky, um, versus if you have much higher levels of calcium, they're a lot fluffier. Um, but I, that's kind of like next level soil management. Um, and again, I wouldn't really recommend in a home garden situation that somebody's just applying gypsum on a regular basis. There's no, there's not really any harm in it, but I'm not sure that you'd really be doing a lot of benefit there if you didn't know you needed the calcium. Um, but people will apply gypsum for sulfur and they'll apply it for calcium and they'll apply it because it's basically pH neutral. It's a way to apply calcium that's pH neutral. Sometimes if you apply lime, it'll impact your pH. So um, that's why a lot of growers use it. But again, uh, I would really get a soil test before you start going down that route of, you know, soft, soft rock phosphate or gypsum or things like that, because then you can really understand whether you need it or not. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that's uh, really interesting. Um, so somebody um, planted fava beans, but has let them go to maturity because they like eating them. Uh, and is there, um, anything they're going to get from the plants at that point? Yeah. I mean, I love fava beans too. Um, <laughs> uh, you'll still, you'll still get something from the cover crop because of the root activity that happened. Um, and because of, yeah, just because of that growth, um, you might get slightly less nutrients, but again, in a home garden situation, I think, you know, just having plants growing is going to be best. Um, if you are harvesting those beans, just think about it. You are taking nutrients out. So um, when we talk about resting the soil or growing cover crops to kind of replenish the soil, you do want to think about if you're not going to be doing that with your cover crops, you want to make sure you're kind of matching that with compost additions um, to kind of balance that nutrient extraction. Mm -hmm. All right, you holding up okay here, Daryl? We got a lot. I'm doing great. I love these. I mean, I right. wish. Yeah. How long are we going until? Six thirty. Yeah. So great. yeah, so, no, I, I, these are these are great questions. I wish I could almost do more back and forth with everybody because I think uh, that would be yeah. great. But this is going, this is working for me. All right. Besides Phasalia, are there any natives that can be other natives that can be used as cover crops? I'm sure there are. Delise probably has. I think there's a link to like <laughs> yeah. um, cover crop resources. Um, but we there's nothing that we use. I think. Um, yeah, I mean, if you think about like what are the California native species and what are they adapted to, um, you know, you think about California poppies, you know, Phasalia is the same. They're not typically going to be putting on a ton of biomass, which is normally um, one of the big benefits we get from cover crops. So as much as I love to have, um, you know, California natives um, around in the mix, um, again, think about kind of what your purpose is. You know, maybe you have your native section of your garden, but then you do your cover crops where you're actually going to plant, right? So each thing kind of has its place and role. Great. Um, here's one. Can you explain the difference between turning soil into um, versus tilling? Um, no, it's, we use it kind of interchangeably. Um, but I think on a garden scale, um, yeah, turning your, your cover crop in, it's, it's a lot more labor intensive because you do have to chop it up with your shovel. Um, and you wanna chop it up into relatively fine pieces so it doesn't just sit around for a long time. What we do in the gardens at the center is that we'll, again, we'll chop that cover crop, take it off and compost it, and then mm -hmm. apply it in future years to get that nutrient benefit. Um, and so we're kind of constantly doing compost additions. And that's a really nice way um, if you have the space and you have the, the labor to do it, you know, the energy, I guess I should say, to do it, um, that it makes planting really easy. 
Um, but again, I would, um, yeah, I, I really like the occultation method. If you aesthetically can live with plastic tarp in your backyard for a couple of weeks. All right. And, and what's the best way to add worm castings to a worm from a worm bin into the soil? Just mix them in. Yeah, yeah that that stuff gold. It's ready to go right away. There's not going to you're not something like that. You know, you would you can worry about using something like chicken manure if you just put that around your plants. One, it's going to be smelly. Two, it's going to be so high in kind of ammonia and, and nitrates that you could run the risk of, of burning some things, burning with too much nitrogen. But worm castings are in this state that it's already they're kind of like compost in and of themselves. So um, you're not going to worry about burning anything. I would just do your best to incorporate it in the soil just a little bit, you know, just you know maybe an inch or so, so it gets into the soil. Um, but yeah, that's that's great stuff. All right, and another one. Uh, I've been told that hairy vetch can be used to prevent funguses in the ground. Um, I've never heard any. On that? I, I, yeah, no, <laughs> never okay. heard that. Um, yeah, I think you know one thing to just be wary of is that there's lots of um, well, I don't know, I, I maybe not wary of, but you know, there's lots of things out there that are 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 worth kind of ground truthing. But you know, I should also on the flip side say I think there's a lot of things that you know home gardeners through intuition have kind of word of mouth has passed on that probably makes some sense that scientists just haven't figured out yet. So I can't say up or down um, on that. I haven't heard of it. Um, the most that we've heard about is. Um, you know, brassicas have this kind of biofumigation effect on some um, kind of nematodes and things like that, but um, yeah, limited. All right, and and when you cover crop around trees, do you turn them in? What what I do is I leave them as a mulch. Um, personally, um, really, you don't want to be because you think about those. You know, the root hairs of the of the fruit trees are going to be somewhat superficial. Um, if you're doing a lot of tillage around those, um, you run the risk of, I think, damaging some of those. So, yeah, I think what our standard practice is, is, you know, we'll just chop them, you know, knock them down, lay them down around the tree. And then if you want to, you can even pile, you know, wood chips on top of that. But around here, you know, at my house, I just lay them right on top, right around the plant. Um, and then maybe put straw on top of that um, to help kind of conserve some moisture. Um, but that's it. And then um, do you do this around uh, citrus trees that fruit in the winter as well? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, we don't have that much citrus on the farm. Um, and it's something that's a little bit, there's not a whole lot of it in Santa Cruz because it doesn't typically do very well, but I don't see any problem with it. I think you might, you might run because the um, citrus trees are evergreen, you know, you might run this issue of um, competition depending on the cover crops that you use. Um, so I would just make sure that if you are putting cover crops down around your citrus trees, that you're being really um, cautious of your soil moisture, um, especially this time of year. If you had a cover crop with your citrus trees and you weren't watering them, those they might con compete for, um, for water. Um, and so, you know, maybe think about some of that faster growing stuff, the buckwheat in the summer, the phacelia, um, or if you are going to grow those cover crops, just make sure you keep them trimmed up. Um, like the, just don't let them get too big or too mature and then really watch your water. Great. And since it's not the right time to put in a fall cover crop, how can I amend the soil for a spring suburb crop? Um, you know, I think the question you have to ask yourself is just, you know, how important is it for you to, you know, maybe like what percentage of your garden do you want to be planting right away in spring? Are you going to plant the whole thing out? If you are, um, you're probably too late for cover crops and that's not going to be the end of the world, right? Um, you can work with what you have and even planting crops in soil is going to be good for it. Um, if you're going to plant half your garden in spring and then think, oh, well, I want to have a fall crop or a midsummer crop and I want to plant half then, then you can definitely cover crop half of the garden right now. Um, all the species that we mentioned, all of those legumes, a lot of the grasses, you could definitely plant those right now um, and they'll do okay. They'll give you some growth. You'll have to be a little bit more on top of the irrigation of it. Um, but the most important thing is gonna be that when you work your soil, again, that you get it to the right moisture. So this is gonna be, you might have to do like a deeper irrigation or a number of irrigation sets, depending on how um, good the aggregation is on your soil. So this is, this is an example, right? Like I think about the, the question that 
you know, they ripped up concrete and there was this like hard packed soil underneath. You could put an hour of sprinkler on that and you might see it puddling on the surface, right? That means that the soil couldn't take in the water at that rate. Um, so what you might have to do is water it for 30 minutes, you know, wait a couple hours, water it for 30 minutes again, wait a couple hours, but you really want to see that moisture percolate down to your depth of tillage, which is going to be about 10 to 12 inches. Um, and then even if, again, your soil is not in great condition and you can't cover crop it, if you get it to the right moisture and you work it, um, that will help for future years um, and growing a crop in it will help. So I think that would be my main suggestion on that. All right. Do you, do you have any cover crops you'd recommend for slope stability? Um, they have these erosion control mixes that tend to be more um, kind of perennialized mixes. Um, so I would, I don't have any specific recommendations, um, but I would ask around and find out, um, yeah, what, what, if there are some more perennial mixes that you can get. And those will oftentimes have some native grasses and bunch grasses and things like that. Um, but you'll just need a plan for kind of keeping them watered um, if you are going to try to perennialize them. But any other, any cover crop, you know, the grasses are the best for erosion control um, because of that fibrous root system, how quickly they establish, they're going to hold the soil the best. So if you're looking for something on kind of an annual basis, then any of the grasses are great. Yeah, and, and does one need to completely weed before planting the cover crop? Um, it is helpful, but not necessary. Um, you know, I, again, I, I think all of this with home gardening is just like, what's the, um, what's the trade off, right? How much time is it going to take you to do that? Do you actually have that time? In an ideal scenario, as was mentioned in the slides, you would actually kind of like work up your soil a little bit and make it like a seed bed and plant your cover crop. That's what we do on the farm with our tractors because it doesn't take that much effort. Or, um, yeah, but in your garden, if you have, you know, even if you have a quarter acre and, you know, you're not going to be able to kind of till that up, um, if you have a lawnmower or a string trimmer, just knock everything back as much as you can. And then, like I said, what we do around here is I just sprinkle the seeds right on top and then put the straw on top of that. Um, and that's normally enough to really germinate them as long as you do it ahead of a rain or ahead of a, you know, a really nice irrigation. Um, it's hard for me to, you know, Delise, I'm almost wondering if we should do like an irrigation course because it's, um, <laughs> it's something that's, it's something that's really hard to, um, to quantify because everyone's going to have a different, um, method of irrigating. So when I say an hour for one person, it could be twice as much water as an hour for another person. So when we talk about irrigation on the farm, we talk about in inches, right? So just like we would do inches of rain, we talk about inches of water applied. So if you had a little rain gauge and you put it out there with your cover crop, if you water that anywhere from, you know, probably an inch and a half to two inches, that would be enough water under a straw mulch for that cover crop to germinate. Assuming you don't have a lot of like really hot temperatures afterwards, but normally that much water will get a cover crop to germinate without any subsequent irrigation. And then you can go on kind of a, you know, once every two, three, four week schedule of irrigation if for your cover crop if there's no rain. Yeah. And and do you have a favorite mulch for moisture retention in home veggie gardens? I mean, I just love straw. You know, I think that's it's great. It doesn't stick around that long, but it sticks around long enough. Um, so I think it's great. And if it does have any like, um, you know, you want rice straw because um, you won't get any weeds, but if you have to get wheat straw and you have some weed seeds, you know, there you have some wheat seeds in it, they're really easy to kind of weed out. So yeah, that's my preference. Wood chips are just going to stick around um, for way too long in a veggie bed situation. So, you know, keep them in your pathways. Yeah, I think that's most of um, what we've been given here. So, and we're at uh, 626. I think we're getting pretty close to finishing here. So hey, I just uh, I, thank I, Daryl. I want to point out that I, um, I put a feedback link in the chat. So the last message here is, um, is about giving us feedback on how we're doing. We appreciate your, great. your input on that. Thank you, Daryl. This was awesome. Yes. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm so glad to do it. And like I said, I, I really, 
you know, I know feedback and surveys are all over the place, but, you know, like I said, this is my first time doing this for a home garden audience. Um, and so, yeah, if there's ways to improve it, you know, getting more on the kind of, you know, how to's or, or examples, um, uh, yeah, I'd love to get that feedback and thanks everybody for time for, um, for attending tonight. Yes, thank you. Thank everybody so much. Yeah. We're going to call it a day. Yeah, that was awesome, Daryl. That's great. Oh, and we have bless. workshops coming up, right? Yes. Jono, go for it. Yes. <laughs> All right. And so let me move these things out of the way here. So, yeah, we've got uh, more workshops, of course, because we're into it. Um, we're going to do uh, winter pruning of fruit trees. Um, again, $5 virtual on February 17th, which is next Wednesday. Um, that's going to come up. That's Oren, right? Yep. Great. All right. Good, good. And then um, we've got beekeeping in March and um, gopher and pest management in April. Um, if you're receiving our emails, um, you'll definitely, we'll let you know. That's for sure. And because you attended this class, you will be receiving emails. Um, you can always opt out of that, but um, you will be notified. So we're working on those dates, yeah. but beekeeping and go for wrangling coming up. Yeah, and, and we will send out a, a link to the recording of this um, in a couple of days. So you can all watch it again. Thank you. All right, Jessica, I think.